Lori Daybell married her husband Chad on November 5, 2019. It was a small ceremony celebrated in Hawaii. Chad and Lori met at a conference in October of 2018, where Chad was talking about his visions of the end of the world. Chad's prior wife, Tammy, died at home two weeks before Chad married Lori. Lori's prior husband, Charles, was shot and killed by Lori's brother four months before she married Chad. Lori's children, Tylee and JJ, disappeared about two months before Chad and Lori's wedding. Now, Chad and Lori are locked up, charged with the murders of Tammy, JJ, and Tylee, and facing the death penalty. Lori has also been charged with Charles' murder in Arizona. Tonight, Lori Daybell returns to court, and we will take a closer look at what happened, her body language, and the ring she was wearing on her wedding finger. I'm Vinny Politan. Great to have you with us tonight here on Closing Arguments. Tonight we're going to talk about the story that I could take the next two hours to try to explain to you in great detail. Many of you are already familiar with many parts of the story. Um, but let's start with the person in the middle of it all. Her name is Lori Daybell. She was the blonde you saw in the open there. This is someone who has been married several times. We call her Lori Daybell, but she had other names. Um, she also had other husbands. First husband, Nelson. Uh, high school sweethearts, they were married for a short while. Second husband, William, became the father of her oldest child. And their marriage lasted a couple of years, and then it sort of went away. Then she married a man named Joseph. Uh, had another child with Joseph, uh, her daughter, Tylee. Uh, their marriage lasted about three years. And then there's Charles. Charles, she was with Charles for a long time, like 12 years. And together they adopted... Uh, a special little guy named JJ. So that's sort of the marital, complicated marital history of Lori Daybell. Nothing illegal about that in and of itself, right? I mean, kind of like one of those Hollywood stars, like Elizabeth Taylor or others, who seems to fall in love over and over again and then fall out of love. Or perhaps like J-Lo as well. I mean, it's not illegal. There's nothing wrong with it. Here's where we start to run into some trouble, though. Two of her exes are dead, okay? Charles and Joseph. Joseph is the one closest to me. He died of a heart attack. He was alone at the time. Uh, no one's been charged with anything. They, they say they've investigated it thoroughly, but he died prematurely, young, from a heart attack. And then there's Charles. He also died way too young. But we know exactly how he died. He was shot and killed by Lori's brother, Alex, and she's now been implicated in that case. Now, there's a fifth husband. Let's talk about him. His name is Chad. Is the fifth time a charm? And I think that's one of the issues we need to talk about tonight when we're talking about Lori Daybell and the charges that she's facing along with um, Chad Daybell. These two met uh, under sort of strange circumstances. Lori was reading his books and then went to a conference, met him. They did podcasts together, and, and their world seemed to focus on a couple of things, one of them being the end of the world, which they were preparing for, and they were going to lead the chosen ones. That was the plan. Um, but what happened, the end of the world didn't happen, but the end of a bunch of lives did, including Lori's children. Um, so now we talk about uh, Chad and Lori, and, and they're both charged in this death penalty murder case. And it seems like, perhaps from Lori's perspective, they may be together till the end of times now. Whatever that means, whenever that is, anytime you have co-defendants in a murder trial, you always think about this, pointing the finger at each other. But I don't know if that's going to happen. I don't know, at least from Lori's perspective, if she's going to point the finger at Chad. And it's all because of what I saw on her finger today. I've got some video from court. Let's take a look at it, folks. 
I want you to take a look at Lori Daybell very, very closely. Okay, that is her, that's her left hand that's up against her chin. And wait a minute, what is, wait, what is that around her finger? I think we may have to highlight that or circle that or something so everybody can see it. There it is in slow motion. What, is that a ring? On her finger, like if you are locked up, right? If you are locked up, you don't get jewelry. So if you want to show the world your dedication to your man, you've got to do it yourself. And that looks like what we saw in court today. Amazing. So does that mean that she is going to stand by her man? She is still connected to, devoted to, perhaps still in love with the man whose backyard was the final resting place for her children. When the world was looking for JJ and Tylee, they were buried in her husband's backyard. Joining me now to talk about everything that happened today in studio, Court TV legal correspondent Chanley Painter is with us. And joining us by phone tonight, Court TV senior director of courtroom coverage, Grace Wong. Chanley, great to see you. Grace, I see your face here in studio. Um, tell us about Lori inside the courtroom today. Um, hi, Vinny. So uh, it was really, for me, a little bit of a surprise because we had been told that she would be entering the courtroom from one particular door and not the public entrance. But as it turns out, she came in through the public entrance and it took me a little bit. I wasn't sure it was her until she actually sat down in the defendant seat between her lawyers because... You know, she was dressed in, in um, civilian clothes, and there was this bounce in her step um, that she didn't, you know, she wasn't shackled. Um, she, you know, she didn't have handcuffs, and so she just kind of, it's, you know, there was this bounce in her step that, that did not uh, betray any kind of uh, somberness to her. She seemed really upbeat, in fact. You know, she smiled frequently. And when she sat down, she seemed very engaged and, and uh, showed a lot more personality than she has ever in any other hearing. Absolutely. And, and, you know, for the most part over the last couple of years, and most of the times we've seen her, she's had a mask on. It's been a, a Zoom camera, all that. We're seeing her in person today. Look completely different. <laughs> Unbelievable. Uh, Grace, a follow up. The courtroom today, there were a bunch of people in there. Who was there? Well, uh, Larry and Kate, Kay uh, Woodstock, uh, JJ's parents, who sometimes have come to these hearings, uh, were not there. And um, there, there weren't any family members that I could see. There were only a handful of people in the gallery. And they were uh, people that came from the community who had been following the story and were through crime buffs. And, and then um, most of the people in the gallery were police officers who had worked on the case uh, police from Rexburg, detectives, and security folks. I mean, it seemed like in this at this particular hearing, there was more police officers than I had ever seen at any other hearing that I had attended in, in Idaho. Um, so with her being there, there certainly was a, a more pronounced presence uh, of security this time around. Absolutely. Also, I mean, her, and I, you know, I don't want to be like catty or anything, but her, but her hair looked you know, different than most criminal defendants, curled. In, she was a hairstylist before. So she's figured out how to do it on the inside, I guess. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable. All right, Chanley, tell us about what was argued today. It doesn't get more serious than this. This is a death penalty case. It is, and the, her attorneys are really trying to challenge that grand jury indictment against her for first-degree murder, conspiracy to commit murder for Tylee and JJ, and of course, Tammy's a part of that as well. So remember, Vinny, her case was on hold for about a year because of her competency, so all of these motions we would have heard probably a, over a year ago are now just being heard because she's fit for trial now. So uh, here's the big picture. The, a couple of motions were argued today, one to remand that grand jury indictment back down to a grand jury for further proceedings. This is where the uh, defense really wants to complain about the counts. They say the counts here are charging uh, multiple crimes per one count, and they say that could confuse a jury. That's taken under advisement. Also, the motion to remand to a grand jury for probable cause as to the alleged aggravating factors. She does face the death penalty. They have to
allege aggravating factors in that notice. And her defense wants to send that back down to see if a grand jury could find even probable cause for some of those factors as they prepare for a trial. That was taken under advisement, Vinny. But I want to play a little bit of uh, portions of these arguments. I believe we're going to start with that second one about this, the counts and why her defense thinks it could confuse a jury. Let's listen. The first uh, motion that we're going to argue today is the, uh, with regards to the uh, aggravating factors, Your Honor. We believe that um, uh, that there should be a probable cause uh, hearing on these aggravating factors. Uh, pursuant to our motion, we indicated that uh, those aggravating factors uh, enhance, uh, if you will, the penalty, uh, and therefore they are part of uh, of of the punishment here. Our main argument uh, revolves around, around counts one and three, uh, that they're uh, confusing to the jury. Uh, they would be confusing to a jury uh, when they have to find this uh, after, after the trial uh, to find this, uh, the, these, these elements. And the, the, I see that the state is uh, saying that the crimes of uh, murder and the crime of, of grand theft are not necessarily the crimes in the conspiracy. Uh, however, this doesn't make any sense uh, because the conspiracy to commit murder and the conspiracy to commit grand theft are two separate conspiracies. Uh, and I'll go through that uh, in, in just a bit. But we do believe that, that it would be confusing to a jury uh, to be able to uh, figure out what elements were met and when the elements were met and to what extent the elements were met. Uh, the burden is high. The burden is uh, beyond a reasonable doubt. If they meet some of the burden uh, at, a, at a different standard, uh, perhaps a probable cause standard, or perhaps a, a more likely than not, or a, uh, or a different standard, uh, that, would be, that would be severely detrimental to our client. Ultimately, the prosecution, Vinny, said that they don't have an obligation under Idaho law to find probable cause for those aggravating factors. And Rob Wood, Madison County prosecutor, we well know, he argued that it would, this grand jury indictment wouldn't confuse a jury. They could understand through jury instructions and whatnot that a conspiracy uh, could involve multiple underlying acts and crimes. Yeah, I, I'll tell you what's going to confuse the jury, or potentially, and this is the challenge for the prosecutor, the case, the yeah. facts. I mean... We're, we're journalists, and, and I'll never forget when we first started covering the story, it took us like three months to try to really understand yeah. what was going on here. And obviously, we haven't seen all the evidence and all the facts, so we don't know everything. But this is a, I mean, my line as a prosecutor used to be to the jury, ladies and gentlemen, this is a simple case, no matter how complicated it was. I couldn't do that with a straight no. face in this one. This is perhaps the most complicated case we've ever covered in terms of what has happened. It's because of all this bizarre stuff. Yeah, absolutely. It's going to be a long opening statement to preview what this jury will hear. That's why it's going to take 10 weeks. Not only this, but it's a death penalty trial. So a lot of information before this jury. I hope they have their notepads and they take good notes. Oh, absolutely. Because it does, took a while to figure this out. And we're still um, you know, untangling everything that's happened. And there's, yeah, there's new things that we learn right. all the time. Another person who's in the middle mm -hmm. of all of this that we find out about. But wow. Okay. Uh, Grace Wong still with us. There she is, folks. Uh, Grace, um, what was Lori like today at the end of court? Uh, well, there was a, um, a hearing, not a, I shouldn't say hearing, but the defense attorneys asked to meet with the judge privately because there was a discussion that they wanted to have with uh, Lori and, and the judge, um, uh, a discussion that would be under seal. So we had to wait some time before she was released and, uh, you know, uh, able to leave the courthouse. And as you know, when, when this happens, there's always a gaggle of reporters that come out to track her whereabouts, uh, to track her, her coming out of the courthouse and ultimately into a car that will take her away to back to jail. And uh, this time we, you know, we waited for her. And when she came out again, she, she was smiling. Uh, she ignored our questions, but she smiled uh, and got into the car. And there was a photographer there from the East Idaho News, and she turned to the camera and gave him quite a big smile. So that, again, is so un unusual um, for a defendant who is facing such serious charges.
and, you know, potentially the death penalty. Her daughter's remains were burnt and left in a pet cemetery in her husband's backyard. Mm -hmm. And little JJ, I, I, it, this, is, this is, again, you know, this is what the case is going to be about. It's going to be try to figure out this relationship, why she was doing this, how she was acting, what's going on up here. Still don't know what their defense is going to be. Um, what is next, though, Chanley? Where, what is happening next as we get closer and closer to January? We're not far from January. In fact, on the books right now is just the pre-trial conference in November leading up to that trial. I'm sure there'll be other motions hearings uh, because this DNA issue that was stipulated to, if that doesn't work out, they're going to bring that back to court. There's also discovery issues. That was mentioned in the hearing today, defense motions to compel discoveries. They claim they still don't have all the discovery from prosecutors, so that could maybe delay the trial. We'll have to wait and see. All right, Chanley Painter, thank you so much. Grace Wong, thank you as well. Wow. All right, folks, when we come back, um, a lot of times when in, in a case where a parent is accused of the murder of their own children, there's no one in the courtroom. There's no one there for, for the victims. And, and in this case, that's not the case. Uh, when we come back, um, little JJ's grandparents will, will join us live and we'll see how they're doing, how they're holding up, and, and their thoughts tonight. We'll be right back. In Delaware County, Ohio, the next live trial on court TV, Matthew Moore accused of murdering his wife and staging it to look like a suicide. Today, day one of the trial, and we have the latest. Um, she loved her life. She loved living. She had a lot of great things going on. No one believed for a moment that she would choose to take her life. The destination. There's little uh, J.J. Vallow and his sister, Tylee. Um, she and he, um, she kind of took care of him a little bit, probably because of what was going on with her mother, Lori. Uh, but this is a special little guy, and he was adopted by Lori and Charles. And for him, um, you know, he needed a little extra attention, and he got all that attention. And he was so close uh, with his grandparents as well. There you saw him with Grandpa. Um, and, and he is the reason that all of this has happened. I mean, because he would call uh, Grandma and Grandpa, FaceTime Grandma and Grandpa all the time. And when those calls stopped, um, Grandma and Grandpa knew there was a problem. Uh, but they were across the country. So they couldn't, like, drive over to the house to, to see what was going on. But, you know, contacted authorities. Authorities went over, and then all of a sudden, that's where the lies started. And that's when Lori fled. And that's when the investigation and the search for these two children began. And now we are where we are. It's a death penalty case. And uh, Chad and Lori Daybell have been charged with the murders. Um, let's bring in our special guest. Joining me in Lake Charles, Louisiana, are the grandparents of J.J. Vallow, uh, Larry and Kay Woodcock. Uh, great to see you both. Um, let's start here. How are you guys holding up? How, how have you been? How did you make it through um, what everyone went through uh, during the COVID times and everything else? How are you guys holding up? Actually, we're, we're doing well. Um, Case had a, a, a lot of issues lately because of all the dates that are associated with this, but she's doing real well now. Uh, she has her bouts and, and uh, she works out of them. And it's, it's hard at times, it's hard for both of us. Uh, you know, the simplest little thing can just absolutely set us off. And uh, we're fortunate. We have such a huge number of people that, that stand by us, that support us, and, and visit with us uh, a lot. And, and I mean visit via uh, video, visit with text, and, and just showing us the support. and. And our family, oh my God, our, our family is so important to us. And it, it's, 
uh, it's trying times, and there's no doubt about it. But, uh, hey, we're going to make it through this regardless. How about today? I don't know if you had an opportunity to watch today. Maybe you did. I don't know if you try to avoid it. Um, did you watch? Did you see Lori? And what are your thoughts about what you witnessed today? Whether we're in Idaho or here in Louisiana, we will be watching, no doubt. Um, and we did today. We did, absolutely. Absolutely. And um, the thoughts, I was, she was very cheerful for someone that's going down for murder and the many counts she's got against her. Um, I don't understand that. I don't even try to understand that because I could never be where she is. So um, it, but I mean, it is what it is and she is who she is. So yeah. we just have to deal with it. You know, the one thing that, today that I got a lot of satisfaction about was her trying to co cover up her miserable life that laughed her and, and the facade that she's putting on. She is scared out of her mind. And I, there is no doubt about it. Uh, that's nothing but a put on, you know. Uh, Hey, let's be, you know, uh, jo jovial for the judges in a beauty contest. Well, this isn't a beauty contest, and she is scared out of her mind. So when you look at Lori now and compare her to the woman who you were, and I've spoken to you before, you were very happy that she was J.J.'s mom. I mean, this was with, absolutely with your blessing. How would you compare what we see in the courtroom today versus the Lori that you knew way back when, when, when she first started taking mm -hmm. care of J.J. with Charles? It's, it's not the same person. Vinny, it's not the same person. She knows she's guilty. She knows what she did is wrong. And she's simply trying to cover up, cover up her miserable life and the miserable decisions that she's made when she knew all along all she had to do was just pick up the phone, call us, and Kay and I would have been there as fast as we could have driven, got a plane, chartered a plane, and we would have been there to pick him up, bring him to a, a fire station, bring him to a hospital, bring him to the sheriff's office, to the city police. And we'd have been there just as as quick as we could have got gotten there. This case, and, and I was talking about this earlier tonight, is a very complicated story, uh, bizarre. We know how tragic it all is. As we get ready for this trial, which will take place in January, are there questions that you two still have about exactly what happened? And are there questions that you want to see get answered at the trial? Or do you pretty much have a, a good idea on, on what transpired here? We have an overall, uh, an overview of what happened and all the little details that um, there's one question that stands out in my mind right now that I won't ask the answer, uh, I won't ask about because I, I just, I, we, I just can't feel like I can handle all the details because they're not pretty. And I guess when it comes down to, we're going to learn a lot at the trial and just have to deal with it then. In the meantime, I try not to get in those uh, FOIA do uh, dumps that have happened from Arizona that have that shed light on this case. Um, I just I don't get caught up in that because it's it's too much. It, it's it's just too much. And the one the one little thing. I'll learn, and, and I'm a month that I can't, I can barely function because I'm just so upset about it. And 
But when the trial happens, then we'll deal with it. So I, I just don't ask a lot of questions right now. I feel like, Vinny, that she'll never answer our questions. I don't think there's any doubt about it. Uh, why should she at, a, at the end of a trial or during a trial? I think, as you, all of us know, the information, the damning information, is going to come from the forensics. And there's no doubt in my mind that she's going to play cover up. Uh, uh, Chad's going to cover. And I think that I, I, the only hope that I have is that they turn on each other and one of them starts talking. And But at this point, I, I don't even know if it's, if it's going to do any good for me personally because what is done is done and we can't undo it, undo it, I apologize. And so for her to spill the, the beans at this point or him to spill the beans, it might mean something to the audience, but to me personally, uh, I, I just, I don't care because what they did was unforgivable. It's totally unforgivable. Are you looking forward to or dreading the trial that's coming up in January? My personally, I am I'm looking forward to it just so we can uh, number one, we want to get their bodies. We want to have their service. They are still tied up in Idaho. And we still haven't had their services yet because we don't have the bodies. So yeah. um, that's one thing that really needs to happen. And we'll, it'll happen when it happens. We have no choice. So we'll wait it out. And then to just to, it'll be a big hurdle to get past that trial. And we pray every day that they are not severed for whatever reason. But there's so many it's a fluid situation and so many things can change quickly. So uh, until I'm sitting there January 9th and they're sitting there or whenever the, anyway, whenever, uh, till I see them in the courtroom and I'm in the courtroom and I'm looking at them, then it's real until then. Uh, it is what it is and we'll get to it and we'll deal with it then. You know, all I've ever asked since since the beginning is just let us have the kids. Let me have JJ so I can do I can do what we have to do as a family. And <clears throat> JJ doesn't need to be we need to in a freezer rest. for two years now. Let us bury him, God's sake. He needs to be put to rest with his dad. They need to be together. That's all I ask for. Just <laughs> let us do this, God. We'll get through it, though, because they're not going to kill us, too. That's, they're not going to kill us, too. We're going to be there till it's over, till till the justice is served. That's you know, what we'll be there for. Don't all, all I ask right now, the judge, y'all do your your hearings and you do your, you got to think about it and all that stuff there. Y'all go ahead and do that. Turn those kids loose. Let us have them. Let us close that door. Let us close that door so I can close that mailbox in my mind. And then what the court does, the court does. But at this point, just give me JJ and, and Tylee and let us, 
do the right thing. I'd ask the judge on my knees, please, let us close this. Let us do right for the kids. Let us do right for our family. Let us do right for the teachers that taught JJ in the American public and the international public that has fell in love with JJ and Tylee. Give us some closure. Larry and Kay, I did not even realize that you didn't have that moment. I'm so sorry for you and your family, but um, we're with you and, and we're thinking of you. And we thank you for your time tonight. And um, I hope you'll speak with us again. And I hope at some point when I speak with you, you're able to lay those little angels to rest the way you want to. Thank you so much. That's all I ask for at this point. Just let us have them. Let us do what's right. That's all I ask for. And let the court system do what the court system is going to do. Absolutely. It's not hard. Just give us the children. My God. I, it's two years. Two years. That little man of mine is, has been in a freezer. Come on, judge. Come on, defense. Come on, guys. Give us a break and let us do something with them. Larry and Kate. I, I'm sorry, guys. I, I just. No, I. I I did not realize the torture that you, you, your, you and your family have been going through. But, again, we thank you so much, and we'll speak That's again. That's our biggest torture, Vinny. Absolutely. I can't imagine. And, and I know you. everyone watching thank right you. now is with you. And maybe, maybe everybody will start beating that drum a little bit for you and help you get that moment. Larry and Kay, thank you so much. We'll be right back. Lori Daybell, a little bounce in her step early on this morning inside the courtroom out in Idaho. What was her body language saying today? Let's bring in our experts. Joining me in Alexandria, Virginia, body language expert, New York Times bestselling author of You Can't Lie to Me, Janine Driver is with us. You can also check her out on TikTok at Body Language Institute. And in New York City, psychotherapist, host of Talking Live on Facebook Watch and the Bite Side podcast, Dr. Robbie Ludwig. Great to see you both. Let me uh, play a little bit of what happened in court today. Let's take a look at Lori Daybell and tell me what you think. Because the, cons the crime is the agreement and then taking an overt act in furtherance of it. It's not the completion. It's not, um, uh, it's not the completion of the crime. It's the crime is the agreement. And the case law on that is clear. Um, and so even if the jury is entitled to see those elements, which they will in this case because they've been charged with those separate crimes as well. Um, they don't have to find those elements. They don't have to find a single element of those crimes to find the crime of conspiracy. There, I, I found no case law to suggest that, that, that that's the case. And I don't believe there is any case law to suggest that. So there she is listening to the prosecutor, Janine Driver. Uh, I'll begin with you. Right, right out of the gate. There's a lot, by the way. I took a ton of notes here for tonight's segment. I know we don't have a lot of time. So um, number one, we see this head tilt. Um, we see this a lot with her in court today, Vinny and, and Dr. Robbie, where she'll often lean her right ear. This is called REA, right ear activation. If you're trying to hear people talking near you, you lean your right ear towards them, especially kids under the age of 13. They do this all the time, but what studies now show are adults as well. When we really want to tune someone in, we see that often with her. But here she shakes her head and laughs. This is this very contemptuous laugh. She also does this eyebrow flash. The eyebrow goes up, which is the prize here. This particular clip that you pulled, Vinny, reminds me very much of Martin Sprelly. I don't know if you remember him. He skyrocketed the price for our aid medicine. He later went to jail for some other stuff. But when he was up on the hill, he had this very contemptuous smirk and laughing, this, this, um, this just incredibly contemptuous 
behavior. However, there are spikes in stress for sure that we see, and I'm interested in what Dr. Robbie, Robbie has to say as well. Dr. Robbie Ludwig, your, your thoughts tonight. I was speaking with um, Kay and Larry Woodcock, JJ's uh, grandparents, and they, Larry said this whole thing's a facade. Um, she is scared out of her mind. What are your thoughts? You know, I think this woman is psychotic and delusional. And even though she may be competent now to stand trial, I think that there's a strong delusional system going on, even a fully ado, which means that you have a shared psychotic system that she shared with her husband. So I don't know what she believes. I don't know if she really feels superior and that she has an understanding of what God wanted her to do and all these people around her are actors and have no clue what's really going on. This woman is a lot sicker than she looks. She's a pretty lady. So sometimes when people are pretty, uh, we can get fooled into thinking they are better than they are. So although we see the stress and the wrinkles in her face, it's uncomfortable for her. I do think that she's not plugged in the way a normal person would be plugged in. There's a delusional system there that's getting her to believe something that's taking her away from the brevity of the situation that she's in. Okay, Janine Driver, Dr. Robbie Ludwig staying with us. We're going to have more of Lori Daybell in court today, plus coming up next hour. And on the docket tonight in Pike County, Ohio, the family feud murder trial, brutal accusations, and eight family members massacred in one day. We have a preview of this upcoming trial on Court TV. Each one of the victims appears to have been executed. Each one of the victims appears to be shot in the head. Emily Noble is reported missing a day after celebrating her 52nd birthday. Her body was staged to appear as though it was a suicide. That was absolutely not the case. Emily's husband was arrested. Two different counts of murder. The question is, was she murdered or was it suicide? This was clearly a homicide based on the injuries that were sustained. Our camera is taking you inside the courtroom as this dramatic case unfolds. The staged suicide murder trial. Live coverage weekdays at 9, 8 central on Corti. For free. The state is planning count two uh, of the indictment that the murder of Tyler Ryan occurred on or between September 8th and September 9th. So that would be the end of that conspiracy. Um, the conspiracy to commit the crime uh, would have been completed and the conspiracy to the murder would have been over. We're taking a look at Lori Daybell inside the courtroom today. We've got our special guest still with us, Janine Driver, body language expert and psychotherapist, Dr. Robbie Ludwig. Let's take a look now, uh, Lori Daybell here, um, listening to the prosecutor, but I want everyone to take a close look at her left hand. Let's take a look. As Mr. Thomas did state, that is controlling. Uh, it's the Supreme Court of the state of Idaho. That analysis starts, uh, their analysis starts with a discussion of Ring versus Arizona, which is the case that found that death penalty needs to be found by a jury. Um, and and uh, that case has been interpreted by some to, to uh, provide that there should be a probable cause finding out aggravating factors, even though the Supreme Court did not actually find that. Dr. Robbie Ludwig, you're not allowed to have jewelry behind bars. She's got a ring, though. She made a ring for herself. What do you think that tells yeah. us about her and Chad Daybell at this point? Well, we know that jewelry can be a linking item. So clearly, Lori wants to show that she is linked to her husband. I think this is her soulmate. Uh, this is the person that she is very much in sync and connected to, and everybody else is almost irrelevant. And she wants to reveal that to everyone in the world. She's very proud to be Chad's wife. In her mind, this gives her status. It's the two of them against the world. And I think this ring that she made is an indication that she is very much connected to him, linked with him, and wants to show her loyalty to him as well. 
It's a, it was shocking, amazing, unbelievable, because, you know, you've got co-defendants, murder trial, yet it seems like they are still linked. Let's take a listen now. The defense there, you can take a close look at it, proudly, proudly displaying mm -hmm. that ring in court. Um, here's John Thomas, defense attorney. Um, here's Lori again reacting to everything. Let's take a look. It brings the jury into a position of, we plead, we, we find them either guilty or not guilty, not, well, guilty of the grand theft, but not of the murder. And it just, it just makes it so that there's too many questions for the jury. Um, not, I'm not saying that the jury isn't sophisticated enough to, to sort through that, but I've been practicing law for 20 years and this particular uh, charge baffled me and I, I had to work through it and, and I still am having issues working through it. All right, Janine Driver, three things people were talking about today. The ring, the, the smiles in the beginning, and then also these lines running through her head. Uh, and, and what the defense attorney was talking about is how confusing some of these charges may be for the jury. Okay, so first of all, let's talk about uh, the lines in the forehead. You have some right now that I can see. These are literally called Einstein lines. And so the deeper they are, I don't have them actually. It's hard to see them. You have them, people who have them very deep, which we do see with Laurie Daybell. These are people who go really deep on a topic. So they'll go really deep. You'll often see this with actors. You'll know, like, so you have like three there. So it's not just you're on television. You're also a lawyer. Who knows? Maybe you're also an EMT. I don't know. Right? So there's a lot happening. So we see these foreheads when they, uh, the wrinkles rather, when she pulls together like this, this stress right here. This is that, I don't know what you're talking about, look. A couple seconds after this, she even does this lip pursing to the side. And if you, I took a screenshot, but I don't, I didn't have time to send it to your producers. She does this weird thing, her whole face contorts, and this is strong disagreement. So if you're ever in a meeting, Vinny or Dr. Robbie or you at home, and someone is going, mm, to the side, this is strong disagreement. They don't like what's happening. So I do believe there is some stress going on here. So although we have this happiness, this laughter, in my world it's called duping delight. He, 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 I say, we laugh, he, he, he. We smile for H is happiness, E is embarrassment, and the last E is evil, this duping delight. It's like, I'm gonna get away with this. So there's a lot happening. Sorry, Robbie, I know you wanted to chime in there. No, I just, I, no, I just wanted to say that in my world, we call it inappropriate affect. And so her her facial expressions are so inappropriate for what's going on. That's what leads me to believe whatever her thoughts are, it's very disconnected and distorted from what is actually happening around her. Um, so whatever meaning she's attaching to her world, it's very different than what a normal healthy mind it's, it's connected uh, to evil. Responded. There was a guy named Neil Entwistle who murdered his, his wife and his young daughter. She was a newborn baby. And when they showed in the courtroom, Vinny, the bloody onesie, the bloody onesie of the baby, he starts smiling underneath his hands. And the old court TV called me in and said, what's going on there? That duping delight, it's like, I'm getting away with it. If you fire someone from your company and they do that little evil smile, you should be concerned. They may be doing more than just keying the side of your car. This is evil because it is inappropriate here. It's called duping delight. It's you think I'm going to get in trouble, but I'm going to get away with it. And maybe not in the court of law. Maybe she thinks she did right by her version of God. Who knows? And the end whistle case, I remember that was out of Massachusetts. Uh, yes. One more follow-up, Janine Driver. I am not an EMT, but I am a DJ. <laughs> See, there you go. I knew so, there was a third wrinkle in that, there. That could be the third wrinkle for me. All right, Janine Driver, Dr. Robbie Ludwig, taking a look at the body of evidence tonight. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. We'll see you again real, real soon.